recording. Okay, hello everyone. Welcome back to this uh, four iteration of uh, Herbert's course, third iteration of Herbert's course. And today he's going to talk to us about uh, his research in the flow of porous media. Uh, but before we start, I wanted to uh, put in the, I will put that in the chat. This is the link for the YouTube videos. Here is the link for the first lecture. So I put it in the chat. Also check out our webpage, the webpage I, I sent earlier when we started the course, but I will put it again. Here, so I will put it in here. Yeah, and uh, there is also an image in the chat box for the buckets buckets puzzle that the, uh, Herbert is going to talk about for the during the first slide. And there is a poll. Uh, let me know if you cannot see it, but uh, I, I I think it should be working now. Where there are the seven options. Ah, actually, you already started participating. Okay, so <laughs> they already know how to use it. Okay, perfect. Okay, so I think Herbert, we can start now. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Sergio. Uh, you always make uh, kind, nice introductions. And thank you for the people for uh, coming. Uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry that I can't be there with you. I would have enjoyed uh, being in China and talking and meeting you all in person, especially as in Cambridge at the moment, it's a gray, gray day, very gray and most uninteresting. But I hope this uh, talk will be a little more interesting. Uh, and we're going to talk about flow in porous media. So far, we've talked uh, using basically the Navier-Stokes equations, uh, flow of fluid that's free to move itself in the atmosphere, in the oceans, uh, on rivers. But today, we're going to talk about flows of fluids through solid surfaces, not totally solid, there are holes and spaces where the fluid can uh, flow through, but uh, the uh, media through which it uh, flows plays an important uh, role. And you see a sort of a sketch here um, where the blue is the fluid that's moving around and the red might be uh, the solid. Before we start, I'll just remind you of this uh, problem which uh, Sajjo told you about, and we'll talk about it at the end. So you have the whole uh, meeting uh, to listen to me, of course, but also <laughs> to decide which tank gets uh, filled first. Well, we've talked about the Navier-Stokes equations where we have the non-linear left-hand side, which causes us so much difficulty because of the momentum, u dot grad uh, u, and then the somewhat difficult viscous dissipation term uh, del squared uh, u. But now that can't be right for a porous medium. Imagine something like this. Imagine solving that equation, which must hold still uh, for the fluid going through this uh, region, which might be uh, foam or um, um, rocks or the whole series of of porous uh, media that are possible. And I'll show you some photographs uh, later. It, it wouldn't be appropriate to solve in that complicated geometry, the Navier-Stokes equation. Here's another example of a porous media where you see <clears throat> there's water and air mixed in um, and uh, rock uh, in the gray matter. So the air and water will move it wouldn't be appropriate to solve the Navier-Stokes equations, though that must be uh, true for small Reynolds number because viscous dissipation will be important uh, when the length scale is small like this. So the Navier-Stokes equations again is written on the top and Darcy in the late 1800s, a French uh, fluid dynamicist basically said, look, in a, <clears throat> a porous medium, the velocity must be really proportional to the pressure gradient. There's a gravity force that'll act, and there might be some other force, uh, which I've indicated by F, a magnetic force or something else. But uh, 
the important part of it is grad P is mu, the dynamic viscosity times the uh, uh, velocity, the vector velocity, the grad P is a vector, over the permeability K. And that tells us how easy it is for the water or the fluid to flow through the uh, solid. If K is the very large, large permeability, then for the same pressure gradient, you can have a relatively large uh, velocity. If K is small, uh, then for a given pressure gradient, it'll be a rather small uh, velocity. And then there's the gravity term, and as I said, some other term. To work out the permeability, uh, for a really rough porous medium is rather difficult. You can only do it by experiment, letting fluid flow through and watching how quickly it goes under a given pressure gradient, maybe a, a hydrostatic pressure gradient. Um, but for spheres, then K is well known. There's a relationship between the permeability and the radius of uh, the uh, sphere. Uh, but all other things you have to measure it uh, specially. Now, this is a, a longer slide and here you see uh, Darcy uh, photographed. The porosity is known as phi or usually determined as phi. It's the fluid volume over the total uh, volume. Um, if it's randomly packed spheres, then phi tends to be about 0.37. I once had a uh, undergraduate student measure phi and k, and he got very annoyed with me after two days of careful measurement saying, it's exactly what they say in the books. And I said, yeah, I just wanted to make sure you knew how to do the measurements correctly. Uh, hexagonally close packed uh, phi might be rather uh, uh, less. Now, Dorsey's law, as uh, it says here, viscous drag uh, dominates and the flow is proportional. I can't quite see what it's saying there, but I hope it says the pressure gradient. So Darcy's law uh, is uh, the U equals minus K on mu grad P plus rho G, um, putting it in a slightly different uh, form. And if it's a moving uh, matrix, then you might take the fluid velocity minus the uh, solid velocity, but that doesn't uh, happen. And the velocity that we consider is averaged over many pores. The whole thing is an average in a sense, because it's not looking at the detailed flow, it's just looking at the average flow, but it's very successful and works uh, very well. The first example I want to give you to continue uh, the uh, last uh, expression, uh, sorry, last uh, lecture, is imagine you have a gravity current, so fluid of density rho, viscosity, uh, fluid viscosity nu, and volume, the inflow of make us QT to the alpha. If alpha is zero, then it's just uh, suddenly a put in volume. If alpha is one, uh, then it uh, is a constant flux. And alpha is two, uh, it's a flux that increases with time. But now it's going over a porous medium with porosity phi. In other words, there's a space in between the solid of uh, amount phi, and it has some permeability K. And the flow, as well as going over the medium, will also drop into it. Um, and we'll have a, a, a thickness of L, which will be a function both of the downstream position X and of time. Now, Darcy's uh, law says very simply that mu V over K is minus uh, dP dx minus uh, rho G. So <clears throat> it's the uh, uh, basically the gravity um, that's uh, supporting the fluid uh, going down. And out of that, you can solve it to get the uh, velocity as you uh, see uh, here. Uh, and we've got uh, the velocity at the boundary because that's going to go down into the porous medium. And then I'm jumping a little bit because as I've said before, I'm not going to spend uh, many, many uh, minutes uh, doing algebra you get the following differential equation. So rate of change of height with time is given 
by this parameter g over nu times d dx of h cubed dh dx. And the right hand side is basically the volume flux down um, into the uh, porous uh, medium that depends upon the uh, ratio of H2L. And then you have to have a uh, conservation uh, law that says, and I think this conservation law is incorrect, it should be H plus phi times L uh, dx from zero to xn of t is equal to qt to the alpha. So H is the height above the interface and L, which should be there, is the height below. Now, you can only get a similarity solution when alpha is equal to three. It's rather strange. Otherwise, you have to get numerical solutions. When you get numerical solutions of that uh, equation, um, <clears throat> and now for alpha equal to uh, one, a constant uh, flux, the numerical solution is uh, shown by the red uh, line. And now experiments uh, are shown uh, by the crosses and the various uh, symbols. And you see that's really uh, very good. If there wasn't a porous medium, if it was just uh, the uh, <clears throat> gravity current going, just like I showed you in the experiment yesterday, it would be the blue line, um, really uh, quite uh, different. And now what you can show is that if the input is sufficiently slow, in other words, alpha is less than three, uh, then it will stop. It'll all drain. It won't go on forever. So you have to have quite a large input in order to uh, overflow. Uh, and that's an interesting uh, uh, aspect. Now, this is one of my favorite slides because it shows porous rock and it shows the variation in porosity that you can have. There are some sections that are really looking quite impermeable. In other words, it's difficult to get fluid through. And then there are the red parts that look as though they have lots of gaps in them, or comparatively a lot of gaps in them, and uh, you can flow fluid through there. Part of the reason that this is my favorite slide, along with the fact that uh, it shows porous layers so nicely, is that I took this on a field trip. And a good friend of mine, a very good geologist, said to me as I was taking the photograph, oh, Herbert, you'll never make a good geologist. You, don't you know that if you take a photograph, you have to have a geological hammer to show the scale. You must uh, put it in. And I said to him, oh, Bob, you'll never make a good geologist because you don't realize the important thing of this uh, photograph is that it happens over all scales. It happened uh, in the uh, rock uh, layer that we uh, were looking at and I photographed with the, where the um, particular layers were uh, about uh, two or three inches or seven or eight centimeters uh, thick. But this is what happens in the Earth's crust. It happens in, uh, on the mantle over a much bigger scale. There are regions where the interfacial difference uh, may be uh, many hundreds of meters. Uh, and that's what I like about this. It shows you how porous layering can really be important in the earth. And of course, I can't go down into the earth's crust and mantle and take photographs there. Okay, now what I'd like to do is to uh, show you some uh, <clears throat> photographs uh, and some theory that uh, um, we published in Journal of Food Mechanics, uh, 720. And the point is, let's imagine you have a two layer system where there's a large permeability in case A below the uh, smaller permeability, and then the other way around. Uh, you see the radius of the sphere and the, the larger sphere, It'll be easier to get uh, through that than it will be, and we can determine the uh, permeability. Now we're going to put a <clears throat> flux of fluid Q into this. And what these red lines are and where they came from, I don't know, I'm afraid. Uh, and we'll look at the first case first, case A, where it's higher permeability 
at the bottom, so it's easier to get through it to the bottom. And so you'd imagine most of the flow will go through the bottom. And you see here it does, but if it can't get through quick enough, then it's going to fill the uh, space and some of it, but not very much, is going to go much more slowly through the upper layer. And it'll look uh, a little bit like this. So gravity, tending this is heavy fluid, the red fluid, and the larger permeability act together to give you something like that. And here's a photograph of an experiment that uh, we uh, took. And you see the uh, <clears throat> smaller beads on the bottom and the fluid is going, the blue dyed fluid is going more rapidly along there because it, there's less resistance and it'll go along uh, there. <clears throat> and there'll be enhanced transport because you're not, or it's not as easy for the fluid to go up. And so it goes down and uh, that is the flow focusing effect and that can be important. Now we're going to do it in uh, the exact opposite uh, direction. And uh, we'll put in the uh, flux in the base of the small permeability, the difficult to get through layer and above it is the easier layer. So to put it anthropomorphically, uh, which my wife always hates, but still uh, the fluid wants to go down and flow along the bottom because gravity is uh, uh, sending it down, but it wants to go up and flow along the easier path on the upper layer. So what does it do? Well, here you see what it uh, does. Some of it goes on the bottom layer, uh, but a considerable amount of it goes on the upper layer. And how much? That's part of what we're going to uh, do. But that's what Edward. it looks like. Yes? Yeah. Sorry? Sergio, can I go on? Sorry. Hello. Sorry. Hello. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. So is this under saturated condition or unsaturated condition? I don't understand what you mean by saturated. The, the fluid that goes through, goes through all the pore spaces. So in that sense, it is saturated. Is that what you so, mean? So uh, before, you, before you, fl you flow the blue fluid in, was oh. the <laughs> sun filled with water or air? No, it's with air. I'm sorry, I should have said that. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay, thank you. All right. All right. I'm one, sorry. One, one, one thing I'm also noticing here is that there is a discontinuity at the interface for the velocity. Correct. So, Correct. so how can you take that, that? Of course, you're going to do modeling because that's what you do. <laughs> so later on, you're going to do the modeling on this. So how can you take into account that sleep, that sleep on that velocity at the interface? Uh, well, but anyway, I guess you, you will tell us. <laughs> you know, you're quite right, Sergio. And I'm sorry, I should have said this was uh, filled with air. But it wouldn't have made any difference if it had been water or a fluid that was less dense than uh, the blue uh, uh, fluid. Uh, but as it was, it was uh, air, because that's the easiest thing to do. And now the other point is, of course, that this blue fluid is heavier than the air and it's propagating in the upper layer and beneath it, there's air. Now that can't go on forever and we'll see what uh, happens. But you're quite right, there's a velocity discontinuity there. Okay, so in this case, gravity and larger permeability act in opposition. And so is that talking to me? Well, uh, and no, no, no. That's fine. What, are, what are the uh, relative uh, um, parameters? There's a flux Q that goes in, there's the G prime. If there was some fluid in there, it's uh, delta rho G over rho. But if there's no fluid, it's just straight G. Uh, there's the height of the lower layer. We'll imagine the upper layer is as high as you want. There's the kinematic viscosity and there's the permeability of the lower layer and the permeability of the upper layer. And they all have different dimensions. 
And I'm going to show you how to use dimensional analysis, which I think is an enormously powerful tool, but not used enough. And I don't think I've said yet that the permeability has the dimensions of L squared T to the minus one. In other words, length squared over time. And I love saying that as, uh, for example, acres per fortnight, because no American knows what that means. They don't know what an acre is, and they don't know what a fortnight is either. Uh, but uh, normally it's, it's uh, centimeters squared per second. Okay, um, now <clears throat> you can see that uh, G prime uh, always comes in multiplied by either KL or KU, we'll make it uh, KL um, over nu, as you uh, see uh, in the bracketed part. So we can bring this down to four quantities, Q, G prime, KL over nu, H the height, and KL over K nu, which must play a role, but it has no dimensions. But the others do have a uh, dimension. And that means that the critical value of Q, which is the value where it'll first go up into the upper layer, must look like G prime KL H over nu, because that's the only way that you can get uh, the correct uh, dimensions, LT to the minus uh, one, um, times some function of KL over KU. Uh, and because that has no dimensions, the function could be uh, anything. But dimensions tells you it just must be of this uh, form. Uh, or if uh, we say we, vary just the height h of the lower layer, uh, then it'll be, I can take this non-dimensional form, nu qc over g prime kl, that must be some constant f1 times h. If I just vary g prime, um, then it must take the form of q2. And if I just vary uh, <clears throat> g prime h, it'll be the form of uh, that you see q3 but all of them have the same functional form f1 if i keep kl over ku constant which i uh, do i use the same uh, porous media and that to check on this dimensional analysis and here you see uh the first graph is the uh, <clears throat> uh, influx that we have to have non-dimensionalized this way, the critical Q um, as a function of the height H of the lower layer. And for sufficiently small Q, there's no overrun. If I make Q large enough, given the height of the layer, there's overrun. And the line through that divides the overrun to the no overrun has a slope of 0.36. Now the second definition of Q, changing the density, so changing uh, G prime um, shows exactly the same thing with the same uh, F uh, value. And now the third definition of uh, Q, so slightly uh, <clears throat> different normalization, but just to see how the thing goes with G prime H, um, we uh, see again exactly the same value, f equals 0 0.36. So no surprise in the sense, Darcy's law and dimensional analysis uh, works. Now, what is the uh, functional form? Well, I've non-dimensionalized it and I've called it uh, f uh, star. And you see that uh, if I plot it in log uh, against the upper layer permeability over the lower layer permeability, minus uh, one, if they <clears throat> were the same, that would uh, make it uh, zero. And you see this curve go through, and I can't quite see what the actual uh, component is, but it's pretty close to uh, my, uh, zero, minus 0 0.33, I guess, because I'm suggesting that's in the purple, that that curve is y goes like x to the minus a third. No one has yet got that curve. I don't think anybody has tried, uh, but it would be an interesting problem to do. Now, <clears throat> this is what it looks like. Uh, you, the first shot is 
when the fluid uh, has more or less just gone over up to the top because it's more than that critical uh, uh, and it's just beginning to drop down a bit but it's heavy fluid so it's got to drop down um, and you see in the second slide it's beginning to drop down and in the third slide the lower slide it's even more the top is the propagating forward just as uh, i uh, showed you uh, but it's losing fluid as it goes uh, down now i showed this once at a uh, somewhere in france and the man said oh i could numerically calculate this and these are the results of his numerical calculations uh, which uh, i thought were remarkable he solved uh, Darcy's law and uh, all of it, and even got the instabilities going down. I've been trying for the last few years to try to get him to write this up and uh, we could have a nice paper, but somehow it doesn't seem to have uh, happened. Now, the next problem I'd like to tell you about and uh, shows you uh, about flow in uh, porous media is to say, what happens if I put a constant flux Q into the bottom of a porous uh, medium, but I put in heavy fluid? Now, it's flow through a porous medium. So the important equation has to be as written here, Darcy's law, grad P is equal to mu U over K minus rho G. But now there are different time scales the early time gravity can't be important even though this fluid is more dense because it's being put in at a certain rate to uh, q and it'll just form a hemisphere as i've sketched here now how can that be well if gravity is not important it will form a hemisphere where the radius which will be a function of time will be given just by Q. You're forcing it through at a certain rate and the pressure will have to adjust uh, appropriately. So that's uh, when gravity plays a rather small role and the viscous uh, effect is definitely going to be there and it's gonna balance the pressure gradient. The gradient that you're gonna have to supply to get it to go through with the input uh, Q. In that uh, time, what you have is conservation of uh, volume, which says that two thirds pi A cubed, which is the diameter of the hem uh, the, sorry, the volume of the hemisphere, must go like Q prime, which is Q over phi, as I hope you can uh, see, times T. That tells you that initially, the radius, and it'll be like a hemisphere, must go like time to the half. So that's the small time, the initial uh, indication of how it goes. Uh, the height. Oh, Herbert, Herbert. Yep. Yeah, hi. There is a question in the chat box. Yeah. Uh, gee, there are 12 things in the chat box. What's the question? Let me see. Why does the heavy fluid fall almost straight down? losing all its horizontally without the inertia giving at least some small forward velocity that was in the the previous one where uh, we had the two uh, two uh, uh, layers well that's because the, it's low reynolds number flow um it, this is flow through a porous uh, medium and it's going basically slowly and so there's no inertia to uh, travel it along so it just falls down okay I hope uh, yeah it, uh, okay these are things okay okay good okay so this is to come back to this this is the initial part and how long the initial part lasts we'll have to talk about where the radius will go uh, like the height they'll be equal the height at the center here which we'll take into account later that goes like T to the half. And the ratio of those two, I'm going to call gamma of T. I'm sorry, I've used gamma, I think in two different ways, uh, but well, we'll understand it. It's basically the slope from the top to 
the extreme part at the bottom, and when it's a hemisphere, that's equal to uh, one. So initially, this gamma t is going to be equal to one, but what we expect is that with a lot of time, this hemisphere is going to spread out uh, more or less horizontally, and gamma is going to get to be less and less. That's uh, the slope. So I called uh, the Allison uh, number uh, because uh, Alison Rust gave me uh, this idea, basically uh, asking a question in the seminar I gave. Um, the, the term of the gravity over the porous uh, resistance, in other words, rho g over mu u over k, and we can work out u because it's a dot, and that uh, goes like this quantity times t to the two thirds, and gravity is very small at the beginning, so Alison gets to be very small, uh, young woman that she is initially. Okay, um, now I'm just going to put in, and I'm sorry, this slide is slightly upside down uh, because it comes uh, from a previous work of mine with uh, uh, Sarah Lyle and, and JFM here, which says, what is it going to look like when it spreads like this? And if it's a uh, slightly light fluid over slightly heavier fluid, rho plus delta rho, or the other way around, which is what it really is, uh, it's going to be the same. The pressure gradient with radius is going to be given by the hydrostatic uh, pressure, uh, the difference in uh, uh, density times uh, gravity. Darcy's flow is going to tell us that uh, the velocity is proportional to the pressure gradient and then continuity is going to uh, tell us that what goes in a little bit comes out again and that's the continuity equation and out of that you get this uh, equation partial differential equation the hdt is equal to gamma and i'm sorry i've used gamma twice in a different way i should have used another term uh, the permeability times the density times G prime divided by the uh, porosity, in other words, how open it is over the uh, uh, viscosity. Okay, so here's the equation written uh, again. Uh, and um, you uh, have uh, uh, the conservation of volume. This is going to be in the region where uh, the porous media plays the large role and the input doesn't play as an important role as it did at the beginning. Then you can get a similarity form of solution. In other words, all in terms of one variable that says the radius will then go like T to the half, like time to the half, and the height will go roughly like one minus Y where uh, y is uh, seen in the uh, line above eta over eta at the valued at uh, the nose. So let's say the uh, slope is pretty close to linear as the gravity is uh, um, the important point and not uh, the input. Okay. So here's a, a sketch of uh, what it uh, will uh, be um, after it's spread out a little bit. There's the height at uh, the origin, it's input at flux uh, Q, and this is the time when gravity plays an important role and the permeability doesn't play such a, an important role. Then the only time scale is given uh, by here, and the only length scale is uh, given by that. And that says that the radius as a function of time must go like little t to the half. Well, that you solve from the equation, but it must be non-dimensionalized by this only time scale. And the height at the origin over the length uh, must uh, go, uh, length scale rather, must go like uh, 0 0.67. And that says, and I'm sorry again that I've used gamma twice, that the uh, slope from the top to the furthest point, um, oh, I can use this from the top here, to the furthest point here, this uh, slope must go down 
like t to the minus a half. And the details are in this uh, paper with Sam Peckler. Well, now what you do is you say, well, look, let's draw the small time and the large time and just see where they join. And just imagine for a moment that this holds for small time until it comes to be equal to the result for large time, which is extrapolated back. And of course, but the area around here is extrapolation. Really, both terms are important here, but this is a simplification. And this is the, the Allison number divided uh, by the uh, porosity as a function of the non-dimensional time. So that's what you get from the analysis. And you could do the same thing for the radius of the blob as the non-dimensionalizing it with respect to the length scale I said before. And this is the small time saying it's just like a hemisphere. And this is the large time saying it's spreading like a gravity current. And then you just extrapolate them and they meet uh, at uh, 0.093. Uh, that's uh, for the radius. Then you can do the same thing for the height at uh, the origin um, at a constant flux, uh, which we're doing. The height will, in the end, be a constant. It'll reflect that uh, flux, as you see here. But initially, it uh, grows uh, like uh, time to the half, I think it is. And you can join them together and say the changeover should as far as the height is concerned, should be at 0.6 something times the time scale. And now you can say, do the same thing for the slope. Initially, the slope is constant and is equal to uh, one, and then it will go down um, as the gravity current spreads and uh, it doesn't uh, get very much uh, higher. So this says, you can take limits in both, in all these cases, but where different terms become important changes with time from being the lowest uh, here, which is the Allison number, to the highest here um, being uh, the height. It's uh, really quite changeable where, in as far as this extrapolation is termed, the lower, uh, the early time is important or the uh, late time is important. Now you say, well, what really happens? Um, and here are some experimental results of different experiments and the two lines that I've uh, drawn here, the extrapolated lines. And you see that the experimental results go very close to both of them. The worst is in the slope, and even there, it's not bad at all. Uh, the slope is pretty hemispherical, as you see here, and then it dies off just as we've uh, calculated. So that really goes very well. And this is a general idea that frequently, and I can think of lots and lots of examples, if you take long-term uh, limits, you can then join them up and they'll work for much of the time. It really is uh, very good uh, indeed. Now, typical values, just to show you what uh, happens in the lab, you put in roughly a cubic uh, centimeter or a second. The porosity might be something like 0.1. The viscosity of water is 10 to the minus two. The difference in density might be 0.1, and I can't see what k is, but it's written there. And that uh, gives you a length scale of 10 centimeters and a time scale of 100 seconds. Now, the same thing happens in the Earth, and that's why I did this uh, problem, because magma is forced into a uh, porous uh, medium, as you uh, saw in the sketch before. Here, the uh, Q is uh, quite a bit uh, different, 10 to the minus five cubic meters per second. The phi is about the same. The viscosity is uh, very much uh, less. Uh, the density difference is about uh, the same. And that makes the length scale about 100 meters, quite a bit longer than in the lab. 
and the time scale something like 320 years, much, much longer than I can do experiments. Um, but that's uh, the way, and we've shown what happens for times, if you like, very much less than 320 and times very much larger than 320. So we can track what the uh, magma as it's put into the earth should be. So here's a sketch of what you might expect. Initially, it's hemispherical and then it spreads out. Um, but now, taking account of the previous analysis, if we put it with a rather closely packed lower layer and have up above a uh, rather less packed and uh, <clears throat> easier flow to go uh, through, the uh, permeability is uh, greater, we're going to get basically a gravity current coming on top. And here's an experiment. Uh, actually, it was just flow being input into a porous uh, layer, and then there was air on top. So it was the simplest thing to do in uh, the laboratory. And you see it's partially spreading as a gravity current, uh, beginning to spread as a gravity current in the porous uh, medium, and uh, it's going up uh, uh, through the air and quicker and spreading out, just as you'd uh, expect. Now, this is important, these ideas in so-called sequestration, which I'll talk about uh, later, where carbon dioxide is pumped down at about a kilometer and injected into a porous layer that might be a few hundred meters deep, as is true here in the Sleipner. At this depth, the uh, carbon dioxide gets compressed and it's... Uh, very much like a liquid, but it's a light liquid. And so it spreads up or it rises up through the pores in the way that uh, we've uh, talked about and then spreads along because it can't go through the, what is uh, the basal layer of the region above because that's solid uh, rock. And we'll talk about that uh, later. I'll just show you uh, a sketch of what uh, the uh, fluid uh, looks like there. Uh, there's uh, salty water because it's over the sea and the injected carbon dioxide, some of it will dissolve, but most of it just uh, spreads along as uh, liquid-like carbon dioxide, supercritical carbon dioxide. Uh, just to tell you, uh, the flux uh, there is, is something like 18 uh, kilogram meters squared uh, per year. Uh, and we'll, I'll show you later how to uh, use that. That's really just a taste. Uh, let me uh, recommend a uh, book on flow in porous rocks, which uh, deals with porous media by my ex-student, uh, Andy Woods, who's uh, now the director of uh, the uh, Institute uh, in Cambridge that uh, looks at uh, flow in porous rocks and uh, a number of uh, different fluid properties uh, like that. Okay, now the take home messages is that uh, Interesting and complicated flows in porous media, and I can't see good. Ah, I see. In porous media, occur in a large variety of industrial and natural situations, and I'm just showing you some of them. You can get simple axisymmetric spreading results, and they have great use in different uh, areas of importance uh, to industrial and natural systems, magma. Uh, flows and uh, carbon dioxide sequestration. You can have heavy fluid flow over light fluid. Uh, you can't quite do that uh, in a uh, uh, open uh, medium. The heavy fluid uh, falls down straight away. But uh, as was uh, asked in the question, when it's a porous medium, you can have the heavy fluid flow over and then it will, after a while, uh, drop down. And then if you have heterogeneous porous medium, uh, you can have different forms, different time scales and geometry, uh, depending uh, on uh, the structure. 
as I showed you uh, before. Okay, now why doesn't this work? Ah, now we get to uh, this uh, problem. We just have uh, enough time. Uh, and Sergio will tell me yep. what okay, the so results are. Can I see that in the chat or? Let me see, I will share the results. Yeah, okay, so you should be able to see it now, probably. So most of you say one, nobody says two, three gets, oh no, most, whoops. Most say, no, no, say four. Sorry, most say four, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Most say four, uh, then comes three, then comes one, a few say five, a few say seven, and nobody says two or six. Yeah. Okay, now I have to tell you, and this is why this is such a good slide in my opinion, all of you are wrong. None no. of you are right. <laughs> and the reason is, how do you interpret what you've seen here? As I see, there's one drop coming down from this faucet. This one drop drops into one and that's the end of it. So none oh. of them could get filled first. Now you could say, ah, but that's cheating. That's a tricky question. <laughs> yeah, that's cheating a little bit. Really what the implication is, is that there's some flow here. Okay, say there is a flow here. Then what's important is what the viscosity of the flow and the rate of the flow is. If this is very viscous fluid and the flow is quite fast, then one will get filled uh, first because the viscous fluid won't be able to really flow quickly enough along the uh, two uh, channels leaving one. On the other hand, what if it's inviscid fluid like uh, water and the tap is turned on enormously rapidly? Uh, then it may, again, only be able to fill uh, one and it won't be able to fill the others. Next, and why I think this is a good uh, research point is that you should look at problems in as many different ways as possible and it'll be beneficial. Next uh, point uh, is I bet all of you assume that these were cylinders, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I never said they were circular cylinders. So they could all be quite different uh, shapes. If one is very small, thin plated, uh, and uh, three is enormous and can hold a huge amount of fluid, uh, then the answer is going to be three. Uh, if it's two that's large, and I've forgotten which one it was that nobody voted for. If it's two that's uh, um, the appropriate size, then, then it's going to be filled first. Then <clears throat> you've all assumed that this is uh, a good uh, representation in three dimensions. I didn't say that. Maybe there are slopes going on here and uh, these channels, uh, they are horizontal looking in the uh, slide, but out of the uh, blackboard, I want to say, out of uh, the uh, <clears throat> screen, uh, there's a slope to them. And that'll change uh, what's going on. And that's why I like this uh, problem uh, very much because it says, when you do research, you have to think about what's really going on. What are the conditions? And I'm uh, reminded and often think about the fact that uh, about 10, 20 years ago, it doesn't matter, there was a big argument between two really good fluid dynamicists because they got different answers to a problem. And they argued for about a year until somebody pointed out that one of them had assumed that a certain parameter was large without realizing it assumed it was large. And the other one had assumed it was small without realizing that it was small. And under those conditions, they got different answers. Uh, and that's uh, what research is about, thinking carefully, what are the conditions under which these different things uh, might uh, happen? So, yeah. 
Huh? This is a very good example for that. Actually, this is uh, an analogy to your porous media uh, gravity flows because there are there is a competition between two time scales here. If there is a competition between the flow time scale coming from the from the tap, and then the viscosity time scale which dissipates. Depending which one wins, either one will fill will be filled or the other ones below one. So. There is always like a dimensionless time ratio, right? There's often a, a, a two different things that uh, happen. Uh, and, and compete. Two, and two and different compete. competing. And uh, who wins and how it wins can depend on the parameters and uh, the situations. Yeah. That's a, a good, uh, I hadn't quite seen that uh, analogy before, Sergio, but you're quite right. Okay. Okay, so do we have any questions for Herbert? Although we already had some questions uh, during the lecture. Yes, and, and please do always ask questions during the lecture. I'm very happy to stop and make things clearer. Yeah. Hey, uh, I, I have one question here. So uh, in one of your slides, you, you talk about, so when you uh, inject the water or inject some liquid at the bottom of the porous media, if there's no gravity, it would be spherical. And then if gravity, you know, well, one second. There, I didn't say, no, 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 it's important. I didn't say if there's no gravity. I said if gravity is not an important uh, uh, point. And this is a, uh, continuing what Sergio says. And literally, as you force it in, it's the uh, porous media has to take the fluid that you're forcing in at uh, Q. And the fact that it's heavy or doesn't play a role, doesn't spread, gravity doesn't play a role. Yep, yep, I got that point. So this, this reminds me, you know, the, the stable shape of a water droplet. So if there's no gravity or if you can neglect the gravity, the water droplet would take the shape of a sphere. But uh, when there is gravity and so, you know, uh, th th these two, they're so similar to each other. Is it, is it possible that they actually have the same shape function? That's very good. Point. Actually, in the case in the case of the bubble, you have an equilibrium between gravity and the surface tension. No, so no. I think that's yes, uh, yes. I think in principle what you say is correct, but in detail it isn't because, as Sergio says, surface tension plays a uh, role, and so initially uh, it's around the drop. But even there, surface tension is keeping it round, and then. Uh, well, that's surface tension is playing the role, and then it gets to be the shape of the drop here, and uh, gravity is pulling it uh, down and making it have this uh, shape with a cusp at the top. Yeah, but I understand the, the mechanism is different, but uh, yeah, probably we can we can check and explore if we have something in, in you know the same. Uh, I don't know. Just, just curious. Yeah, I think. Well, again, uh, uh, if you had a uh, a drop, uh, a small drop like uh, the one we see here, and it was allowed to just drop on a flat surface, it would take this uh, drop-like shape because of surface tension, uh, and then when it drops on, uh, sorry, because of gravity, and then when it drops on the uh, surface. It will be uh, spherical because of uh, surface tension. Yep. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Do we have any further questions for Herbert? Okay. So I think uh, we can stop here. Okay. Then, yeah, we will have a break. So during yeah. next week, we will not have the uh, lectures, but then the week after, we will restart. I, I look forward to that. Chapter four. For chapter four, yeah. So as always, thank you very much, Herbert. This is very exciting, very interesting as always. Okay. Uh, we will see you then on Tuesday, the, sorry, let me double check. Tuesday, October 11. Right, okay, well, I have that in my book. Could I just ask Sergio, how many participants were there today? There were 53 participants. Okay. 
Okay. Okay. Right. Thank you much, very much, everyone, for attending, and see you then. Thank you. Have a good bye -bye. Uh, weekend break. A week break. Bye. Bye.